expected originally to be here. I'm very pleased with that. Uh, I, I'm very glad to be here as well. Uh, I, uh, this is the first one that we've done of these training seminars. We have a series of them throughout the Northwest Colorado region uh, over this week and next week, and, and the week after that we have a couple more as well. And so if you do want to travel up to Craig to have a review of this in a couple of days, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, otherwise, we'll just do what we have to do here. Uh, because this is the first one, uh, I'll, I'll admit I'm a little bit nervous that I'm doing this right now, but I'm not going to let that show much more than to say uh, a couple of times and to ask you for your feedback at the end of it so that we can make the ensuing ones even better. Uh, this one is being recorded so that we can present it on the web as well uh, and make it available for your residents and the businesses that might be interested in the material as well. Uh, because, because we're a little spread out, I'm probably going to stand up so I can pace a little bit as well. And, and this way I can see all of you a little bit better. Does the microphone still pick me up effectively if I stand this far away from it? Fantastic. Uh, we are a small group, so I would like to encourage you if you have questions or comments throughout that you go ahead and you throw in with them. You do have, most of you have microphones in front of you, and so uh, make sure that the little green light is on uh, if you have something to say so that we can uh, get that on the recording as well. Uh, we will be editing it, so if you say something that I don't like, I'll just take it out. <laughs> That's the way it will work. Uh, what, the reason we are here is because the Northwest Colorado Council of Governments uh, is in the middle of doing a broadband, a regional broadband plan. And that region is, is quite extensive. I, I have a, a drawing of it here that we'll get to in a minute. But the objectives that the Northwest Colorado uh, Council of Governments had as part of their strategic plan was to assess the regional infrastructure and the service needs throughout uh, through public meetings, much like this one. Uh, and so I need your feedback as part of this through surveys. We have a survey that we've built that we've put up online uh, through interviews and through investigating the, uh, the assets that are in the region and mapping those assets. Uh, we're going to provide uh, educational workshops like this one to get people to have a better understanding of the legal environment that ha exists here in Colorado and also to make sure that we have an understanding of what broadband is and what it can do for the region and how we can make a difference. Uh, we're going to identify the public and private projects that are underway right now. I'm sure that all of you, uh, you're here, so I'm sure that all of you have heard of the EagleNet travails over the last two years. Uh, EagleNet is finally building again, and that's a fantastic thing. Uh, and they have some destinations here in northwest Colorado. In conjunction, there, there's also been a couple of other granted projects over the last couple of years. There was a Colorado Telehealth Network. There was a Libraries and Schools grant and some others that have brought uh, some new infrastructure and some new interest in broadband into the region. We're also going to identify, or at least we're going to begin to identify, broadband gaps and strategies to close some of those gaps in the region. As I was saying at the beginning of the, uh, in, well, we were trying to get things running, the region is large. It's a big area. And the, the differences in the region are, are vast. And so as we look at the gap analysis, we'll talk a little bit about what some of that gap analysis means uh, as we talk about the, the different technologies that are bringing broadband here into northwest Colorado in, in just a minute. Uh, we're going to address sustainability. And, and there's a little bit of a question about how that works sometimes. What, what it really boils down to frequently is that these broadband providers are businesses, whether, whether it's the government that's providing the broadband or whether it's a private business like Comcast or CenturyLink or, or, or uh, Resort Broadband. Uh, these organizations need to have a way to pay their bills. And so sustainability is something that is critical as we talk about broadband. Almost always, when you have an environment that is not uh, sufficiently meeting broadband needs, it's because of that sustainability question. And I'll address uh, why I say almost here in just a little bit. The region is all of the Northwest Colorado Council of Governments uh, participants, which is Eagle, Grand, Jackson, Pitkin, and Summit counties, and most of the municipalities within those counties. Uh, Steamboat Springs, Glenwood Springs, and Carbondale are also members of the Northwest Colorado Council of Governments, and also uh, Moffat County, Rio Blanco County, and Route counties joined into the project to participate as well. Now, there are, in within that region, there are some non-participating communities. I don't know them well enough to leave them out. As we look at regional broadband, uh, frankly, the, the, we have to look at regional broadband. 
Uh, and, and if one community has elected not to participate in the study, we can't leave them out because they are part of the region. So frankly, it is going to be that in this entire northwest corner of the state of Colorado that we're looking, that we look at, we're, we're studying, and we're finding the, uh, a lot of great information about right now. Uh, the project team consists of, first, the Northwest Colorado Council of Governments. Uh, it, is the nor it is a Northwest Colorado Council of Governments project that we are working on as we're doing this. Uh, and the members have a critical role to play in the project as we move forward. Uh, secondly, uh, the Northwest Colorado Council of Governments hired a company called Mid State Consultants to, to help do the technical work and to put together the plan uh, and to provide the advice and other things of that nature that need to be done in order to uh, develop the, the regional broadband assets and some other things of that nature. Uh, I work for a company called, I work for Mid-States, I, I, I'm a full-time employee of Mid-State Consultants, but Mid-State Consultants also asked me as part of my employment to own and operate a company called OHIV. Uh, and OHIV is my company and, and right now I am, you are looking at the entire company right now. <laughs> uh, we, I have had uh, up to 15 employees and, and sometimes on none, like right now. Uh, but what my company does is, is uh, municipal and regional-wide broadband analysis and recommendations. And so that's why MidState has asked me to do that. MidState's primary focus is designing and building uh, networks. Uh, and they haven't spent, in their 50 years of business, they have spent a great deal of time doing loan designs and, and, the, and the business analysis that's required to do those loan designs and other things of that nature but they haven't spent much time in the step before that, which is project initiation. Uh, and my company has spent a great deal of time there uh, in the project initiation phase, gaining the information and understanding the regional needs so that we can write the loan designs and, and design the networks and to meet those needs. Uh, and so that's the, the project team. Uh, we do wanna take a little bit of time uh, to, to just talk about what is broadband, because there's a lot of you know, when we talk about broadband, I can be sitting in Sandy, Utah, where I live, with my 20 megabit download and my uh, 5 megabit upload, and I say, I need more broadband. And yet, when I compare that to the hotel room that I stayed in last night, where I did a speed test, with its uh, 560K upload Woo. and its 3 megabit download, so I was impressed it had a 3 megabit download. And I was thinking, <laughs> and, and, there, and that was their free, fast broadband service that they had for me. And so the, the definition of broadband is vague and, and not clear. Uh, the FCC has defined broadband as, right now, four megabits down and one megabit up. That's the, the marker that they have set it at. Now, in another place, the FCC defines it as anything faster than dial-up. Huh. Uh, it, it becomes very vague when you try to read through the federal government as to what they mean by broadband. And when they're basing their grants and loans on availability or non-availability of broadband, that definition becomes critical. And the FCC has waffled on it again and again and again, and it's very difficult to come to uh, uh, a, a firm definition. There are some characteristics of broadband that the FCC has been consistent on. Uh, it provides a higher speed of data transmission than dial-up. That's one of the things that they are consistent on. And as time marches forward, there's been some indication that the federal government will be changing that definition to keep up with time so that the speed will keep getting faster and faster for what the definition of broadband is. Uh, it provides access to the highest quality internet services. And there's where a big question about what broadband really means. Can I get the highest quality broadband services with three megabits download? Uh, at, with my free high-speed wireless at the hotel last night? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. With my 20 megabit download at my home in Sandy, I cannot get the, the best and highest quality of internet services. Because HD video does not work effectively on a 20 megabit link. It works somewhat, but it doesn't work effectively. So is 20 megabits not broadband then? It's, it's a question that has to be considered. Another characteristic is that broadband is always on. Uh, it doesn't block your phone lines like you, the old dial-up modems do. Uh, and another characteristic is there's less delay in transmission of content using broadband. That, that latency issue is a critical issue of broadband as well. Uh, and that's why there's some argument as to is a satellite connection broadband at all because satellite connections can provide you a significant amount of download 
uh, 10, 15 megabits download capacity. But the latency on a, a two-way communication with a, a satellite connection is extremely high as those four bits have to run up to the satellite and back down to the Earth and all over the Earth and they, get, they just get dizzy. Um, as we look at the different types of, capacity, of, of connectivity for our internet connections, uh, we're, we're all, I'm looking here in this room and we all have a little bit of gray in our hairs. We all can remember the sound of the dial-up modem and what it, uh, what the joy it was when we first discovered the internet using our dial-up modems. It was a fantastic thing. Uh, but uh, if we were to try to download a high-definition movie uh, using a dial-up modem, the Pony Express would be faster. It, it takes 19, it takes nearly 20,000 minutes to dial, to, to download a, a high-definition movie over the capacity that a dial-up modem provides. Standard DSL, which is what a lot of this Northwest Colorado region has as one of their only broadband options, is a standard type of ADSL type of service. That same movie would still take 370 minutes to, di to, to download. Uh, faster DSL, which is called VDSL, it, it is significantly better than the ADSL, which has a greater distance to reach. Uh, but the, the fast DSL would still be about 74 minutes. A fast cable, it would take you 55 minutes to download that on a DOCSIS uh, 3 type of system. 100 megabits fiber, which nobody in the region has 100 megabits fiber except for a couple of business locations that I've been able to find throughout the region. Uh, it would take you 11, min 11 minutes. If you lived in Kansas City, it would only take you one minute to download that same movie. Uh, so when we talk about what is broadband, where you are and the technology that you have available to you makes a significant difference as to what the definition of broadband is going to be. Uh, here in the Northwest region, there's, we also have to look at a little bit of the difference between um, advertised speeds and, and actual speeds and the type of technology that we are using to do the downloads. Uh, this test that I did here, the data that I collected here was for Steamboat Springs. Uh, in Steamboat Springs, I was able to find three reliable broadband providers. It was CenturyLink, Comcast, and Resort Broadband. Their advertised speeds were between the 1.5 to 40 for CenturyLink. That 40 megabits per second was only available in, their, um, uh, in the business districts of Steamboat Springs. Comcast offers 3 to 105 megabits advertised speeds in Steamboat Springs, which tells me that they have their DOCSIS 3 system in place. Uh, where resort broadband, ha broadband has download speeds of 3 megabits per second. But when we look at the tested speeds, that's a difference between what is advertised and what is tested, and that's one of the failures of the federal government's broadband mapping program. The federal government right now is only using the advertised speeds to determine who has broadband and who doesn't. But when we look at the tested speeds, we see that Cent CenturyLink is providing an average of 5.6 megabits per second download compared to their 1.5 to 40 advertised speeds. Their average download speed for uh, Comcast is 15.2 and for Resort Broadband the average download speed is 2.2 on a tested basis. So when we look at broadband, when we do our survey, we're asking for two critical pieces of information. We're asking you for first to tell us what it is that you actually subscribe to if you know what it is on the survey. And then secondly, we ask you to take a test later on that we'll look at and we'll compare uh, the uh, tested speeds to your advertised speeds that you have. Uh, and that will create for us a better picture of the broadband environment within the region. It will create for us a better picture of where the gaps are and how we can help uh, close them a little bit better. Broadband, as, it, as we said a minute ago, gives you access to the highest quality internet services that are available. When we look at the internet services that are available today, we have a, like a standard definition television and a sharing of four megabits a phone and internet service, we're up to a, about a 24 megabit need just for a standard television, uh, standard definition television environment. In, in the near future, which uh, in, in many communities is right now today, you've got your high definition television, your uh, larger sharing burden, um, the internet services and video car uh, conferencing, uh, 94 megabits per second that we can say a legitimate need for at a residence today. Uh, and as we move into the, the immediate future as well, 
We see three, def three definition, three ETV uh, coming to be a valuable service to residences. We see high definition video conferencing for medical services, at home medical services and other things of that nature that are driving this need higher and higher and higher and making the Google promise of gigabit ethernet more and more the common definition of broadband and less and less the exception definition. In our businesses, there is this concept of uh, virtual presence is one of the things that businesses are looking for right now. To be able to do business around the world as if you were working with the people right in the room with you. Creating that virtual presence so that when you want to have a training seminar just like this one, I could be standing up and pacing in my room in Sandy instead of costing the travel expenses to do this. And you could be sitting here in this room and, and we would be sharing the space as if we had a virtual presence. That's a powerful tool that businesses need. That businesses in Northwest Colorado with the difficult transportation environment that exists in Northwest Colorado, businesses here need it in particular to be able to compete on a national or worldwide market. But the capacity that's needed in order to make this happen is a symmetrical. Your download and your upload speeds need to be similar so that, the, so that both sides of the conference are working effectively. And we're talking 100 megabit speeds in order to start to make it work effectively. Both download and upload. What is broadband? I can't find anywhere in the region right now where I can consistently get 100 megabit symmetric speeds. For our education needs, we did a study uh, not terribly long ago. We worked with EagleNet on this study to, to determine what types of needs do our uh, schools have to have in order to meet their broadband needs to provide the 21st century education that our kids need. And as we looked at the region, the region doesn't meet those needs. Now as EagleNet is building again, and hopefully it will get to most of the school districts in the region, I know that there's at least one uh, that has been, been excluded in their revised models as they got some of their money taken back and uh, had to change their scope a little bit. Uh, but they, hopefully they will be able to get to the school districts. But once they get to the school districts, EagleNet doesn't have a mechanism to distribute throughout the communities. And so we have a little bit of a difficulty there. Our schools need fast broadband. In the National Broadband Plan, in addition to education and business and residential needs, um, the federal government identified health care, again, education, energy, and the environment, and the economic opportunity, government and performance, civic engagement, and public safety as the seven key areas that broadband makes a difference in people's lives, in the, as the seven key areas why we need to have a broadband plan and why we're going to grow broadband through the country. Uh, why it was the part of the justification for why there was uh, federal stimulus money to do projects like EagleNet. In sum, access to reasonably priced high speed bandwidth acts as a gateway allowing residents and businesses to enter world markets and opening access to innovations in telemedicine, government services, education, energy conservation, and other areas. So we can talk about broadband, and most of the time when I talk about broadband, I'm going to be talking about three specific characteristics that are important in broadband. It's the speed of the connection, both upload and download. It's the reliability of the connection and, and having the confidence that it's going to be there when you need it, and it's the cost of the connection. Those are the three key areas that I'm going to talk about when I talk about broadband. But underpinning those three key areas, what does it matter if you're fast? if there's nothing to do. So underpinning those three key areas of speed, reliability, and price are always that question of why. Why do you want it? You want it to improve the business opportunity and quality of life of the people who live in your communities. And so that's what we talk about when we talk about what is broadband. I'm going to pause for a moment and say, does anybody have questions or comments or thoughts before we move on to uh, how the region is comparing? I'll take that silence as a, let's move on. What, what time is everyone expecting to be finished so that I can watch the clock? 10.30? All right. How do we compare? The, first, let's look at how the United States of America compares. Uh, we're middling. The United States of America is not, we invented broadband. 
And yet, on some uh, scales for broadband on the OECD countries, we rank 17th. Uh, I've seen another scale where we rank 23rd in the, in the world uh, when we compare all nations for uh, speed and cost of our internet connections. Uh, when we look at quality and uh, adoption, uh, you can see on this chart, you can barely see the United States flag. It's in that big crowd uh, just below the center and about halfway from the right of center. We're in the middle of, a, of developed countries as a nation. Uh, uh, the Akamai, Akamai runs worldwide data, data centers. And in those data centers, they track the data that comes through and from where it's coming and other things of that nature. And they track the speeds that the end connections have to that uh, to their data centers and they're one of the largest data center companies in the world and so they have quite a bit of data that they have to work from the united states on akamai's data rating is 35th in the nation as far as the speed of connection that we have we're, we're not we're not terribly fast we're middling as far as development developed nations are when we look at the states where does Colorado sit in? TechNEC did a state-by-state -state survey of, of broadband connections, and they looked at three variables grouped into three major categories. Adoption rates, uh, the network speeds, and the economic structures that support it. And when they look at that, they're looking at the types of businesses that use broadband and depend on it, and they're looking at uh, uh, support for deploying networks and other things of that nature. Colorado ranks 22nd in that overall ranking from, from uh, TechNet. If we look only at the speeds, Colorado ranks 35th. The state ranks pretty high when we look at the eco economic structures, because there are a lot of technical businesses in Colorado. And so they rank pretty high on that one. But the speeds that the state offers drops the, drops the state down to 35th. Colorado is a middling state in, in a middling country when it comes to broadband. When we look at the Northwest Colorado, uh, we did a couple of studies around uh, comparing the front range to uh, Northwest Colorado and Southwest Colorado and, and uh, the rest of the western, uh, uh, western Slope. And what we come up with is if you're a public school, your average download speed on the front range, 16, 20 megabits per second, here on the Western Slope, five. The Colorado State Library, 100 megabit symmetrical connection. Average library connection on the western slope, three megabits download. When we look at our government offices, uh, average, uh, the state has an 81, 82 average connection speed, download speed. The average government office here on the western slope, five, five megabits per second. That constrains our education ability, that constrains our ability to engage our citizens in civic engagement over the internet. It constrains our ability to succeed here on the Western Slope. The Western Slope uh, is at the tail end of a middling state in a middling country when it comes to broadband adoption, speed, and cost. And so that's why this broadband plan that the Northwest Colorado Council of Governments is engaged in right now is so important, it's so critical, is because without the ability to step up to the plate and, and perform, this region will continue to trail in economic development, in education opportunity, and in uh, other quality of life elements that exist because the internet is growing it throughout this world. That was that section. Hammered through that one pretty fast. Uh, any other questions or thoughts before we move on? OK. Uh, the next section that I want to talk about is a little bit about how does broadband get delivered to us? Because as we talk about, well, what can we do about it? What can we do about the speed and the cost and the reliability? We have to know what, how is it getting to our individual homes uh, and the path that it takes. So I would like to take a little bit of time to talk about some of the broadband uh, infrastructure that brings us into our uh, homes and our businesses. 
Uh, there are several last mile mechanisms that can deliver broadband to each of us. So as we talk about the internet, as we talk about developing a regional broadband plan, we frequently talk about what we call last mile and middle mile, and sometimes we talk about it as first mile or interconnect or peering or any number of words that go with that, that first one. And in order to give you a little bit better, clearer picture of that, when we talk about last mile, that's the, the delivery mechanism that takes you from uh, what in the old days of the telephone companies would be called the central office and brings it out to all of the individual addresses. The middle mile is what delivers capacity to those central offices. And the first mile and the peering points is what connects that middle mile infrastructure to all of the rest of the world. And that's a, you know, obviously a gross oversimplification. And it also has a lot of variation in the definitions of those terms from uh, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, but as we talk about this, that's the, that's the general concepts that we'll use to talk about this. So one of the capacities, one of the available me mechanisms to deliver the last mile is wireless. And wireless gets a lot of advertising, a lot of uh, hoorah, uh, because for companies deploying it, it's pretty cheap for them to deploy. They can throw up an antenna and catch a number of addresses. They can oversell that attenda antenna to get a significant amount of revenue from that. Uh, single antenna. Uh, in very rural places, their business model is a little bit more difficult because obviously the wireless has a range uh, limitation uh, and you need a, a, a number of subscribers in order to justify the cost of putting up the tower and getting other things of that nature. And if you can't get enough subscribers on it, it's difficult. But in rural areas, it also has the best opportunity because it doesn't require physical wires to be run to every home. Uh, one of the things that happens on a wireless uh, network is the wireless access points are a shared infrastructure. So uh, we had an instance in, in the Salt Lake Valley. Clear Wireless came into the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, they're a fantastic wireless service provider. They advertise heavily. The first couple of people who subscribed onto it, brilliant broadband access. It was extremely fast. And then the next couple of hundred that subscribed, it was adequate. And then by the time they got up to thousands of customers in the valley, they had oversold their radios. And it was extremely difficult to find a time when it was an effective service. And it was, it was a bad scenario for them in the Salt Lake Valley. I think that they've had better experience in some other areas, but that's what they, uh, happened there. Uh, the next technology that is uh, easy to deliver is the, on the telephone lines. Uh, the telephone companies have been delivering a service called DSL for uh, quite a long time now. Uh, DSL comes in a lot of different flavors. Uh, the different flavors of DSL have different uh, distances that they can travel before the signal degrades so much that it's not, uh, that it's not valuable any longer. Uh, the closer you are to the telephone company's central office where the DSLAM is, the faster your speeds will be. The further you get away from it, the slower they will be. Uh, the telephone companies have done quite a good job. Uh, almost all of the Northwest Colorado region is serviced by CenturyLink. CenturyLink is doing some work to ensure that they get DSL and they upgrade their DSL services up into all of the communities. In fact, as I was driving through Glenwood Springs, I noticed that they're in the middle of doing a, a fiber to the node construction project, which takes the fast DSL closer and closer to the residents, which means that more and more people can have that uh, faster DSL product. Uh, I don't know what other communities CenturyLink might be doing that DSL upgrade in, but I do know that CenturyLink is one of the recipients of TAF funds. The uh, uh, Community Access Funds is, is a federal government funding source to be able to improve broadband services. And I also know that CenturyLink, in order to uh, get Colorado to approve their purchase of Quest, agreed to spend some significant amount of money in Colorado doing network upgrades. So there's some work that we can do, uh, and this is where Club 20 can do a huge amount of very good work, is to help divert CenturyLink's spending from the Denver metropolitan area out onto the western slope so that we can get that money upgrading here where we, where we need the services more, less profitable for CenturyLink to do it, but the service need is greater. And that's why we need organizations like Northwest Colorado Council of Governments and Club 20 and other organizations that have uh, consolidated influence to make a difference to help uh, develop those uh, upgrades. Uh, DSL can provide 
uh, usually between one and a half to 15 megabits of download speed as you get closer to uh, the central office. The telephone company will advertise significantly higher speeds than that. Uh, I have never had uh, a successful connection on a DSL line except right next door to the central office above 15 megabits per second. Uh, I subscribed to a DSL line for a long time that was supposed to be a 20 megabits download service and my average speed was seven uh, because of my distance from the central office. Uh, cable is the next mechanism that delivers. Uh, the cable companies, as you're all very well aware, when they first came into being, were just simply trying to get television. In fact, uh, I always think it's an interesting side note. The first ones were built, the first cable systems were built by appliance stores because they had these very expensive TVs sitting in their appliance store and they couldn't sell them because nobody could receive the television service because they lived in a little basin and the, and the radio waves wouldn't reach them. So they would build a community access television, CATV, uh, and, and then they would drop a wire down and then they'd be able to sell television. That's where cable television came from. Entirely a one-way transmission mechanism. No need for any upload data at all until the internet came along and the cable companies wanted to play in that business and they had the, ca the wiring to be able to do so. And at that point, they created a thing called DOCSIS, or Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. Uh, and the DOCSIS created an upload path and a download path that they could use uh, in order to deliver television. DOCSIS 1 was a miserably slow and bad implementation. We're up to DOCSIS 3 with DOCSIS 3.5 in the works right now. Uh, DOCSIS 3 binds channels together and frees up a bunch of space and can deliver up to 300 megabits. It's an amazing service. Most of the time, they limit the, the, what they sell to folks to right around 20 or 30 megabits. Uh, a lot of DOCSIS 3 communities will have 100 megabit. Uh, a lot of the Northwest Colorado region is served by Comcast. Comcast does have DOCSIS 3 throughout most of their footprints, and they're upgrading uh, other footprints to DOCSIS 3 on a regular basis. Comcast is doing a fantastic job of trying to keep that up to date. Uh, in smaller communities where uh, smaller telephone companies or smaller cable companies rather are, are bare sway, uh, a lot of those smaller companies have not implemented DOCSIS at all. They have no data capability at all. Others of them are buying DOCSIS 2 equipment because it's cheap uh, and they can get it uh, at a very low price and, and then that limits the capacity that they can provide to their customers uh, to about a 7 or 15 megabit download, uh, 7 to 15 megabit download. So cable is one of the ways that we're delivering broadband. Uh, in the Northwest Colorado region, we don't have anybody who's doing fiber to the premises. In fact, one of the things that was frustrating to no end, the Colorado Telehealth Network had either, they could either deliver uh, broadband to hospitals and health clinics via a T1 circuit, which is an old telephone line type of circuit, which has a one and a half megabit download and one and a half megabit upload or they could deliver it via what they called Metro Ethernet, which is a fiber to the premises type of service which has a, a significant amount of capacity. Uh, and when I went through the Colorado Telehealth Network's uh, deployment schedule, every single western slope, whether it was northwest Colorado, southwest Colorado, central western Colorado, every single western slope hospital and clinic was being delivered via T1 service. Not a single one of them received the Metro Ethernet service. Even though Metro Ethernet was available in some of the towns, every single one of them, T1 service. So what happened with that Colorado Telehealth Network is there was a great opportunity that the Western Slope could have had new infrastructure investment to extend the Metro Ethernet out to these hospitals and medical clinics, uh, which place this, the businesses and residences adjacent to that path could have subscribed as well. There was that great opportunity, but the vendor who won that contract, CenturyLink, but in, in most part, decided not to do that. Was it, Paul, was it CenturyLink who made the decision not to do that, or was it the, the organization who said, I can't afford to pay the monthly low costs for that fiber? I mean, the yeah. college just, we just finished our last site. All of our locations now have Metro Ethernet, fiber to yeah. that mode. And I know, I know what those pricing differences are. Real steep. Uh, the, the, uh, because they're looking yes. for, as you said early on in this conversation, they're in this business to make money. 
Yes. So they have to have a return on their investment. Yes. That, that, and, and they don't well, want I agree. to. It, it fills out, but I can see a lot of cases with some rural areas sitting in Meeker going. In a rural place there. sitting in Meeker where the Metro Ethernet, Ethernet doesn't already exist in Meeker, I'm not frustrated by that. Right. But when I look at a town like Steamboat Springs where Metro Ethernet does exist, when I look at a town like Durango. This last August, we were disclosed when we were able to buy it. Right. Uh, I, it, I started this study, this part of the study, the, the Colorado Telehealth Network study, when I was working with the Southwest Colorado Council of Governments. So Durango is the place that really chaffs my hide on that one. Because Durango has had Metro Ethernet for uh, years. Uh, and yet, the hospitals in Durango got connected via T1 to the Colorado Telehealth Network. Uh, and it was because uh, it may have been because the Colorado Telehealth Network didn't want to cover the subsidy difference between the T1 and the Metro Ethernet. Uh, it may have been because CenturyLink didn't want to cannibalize the revenues they get off of their T1 lines because they, that's almost pure profit for them. Uh, it may have been because the hospital didn't want to subscribe to a Metro Ethernet service. They just wanted the T1 service. The reasons why, I, I don't know. But what I do know is there was a great opportunity there to exert political pressure and business pressure to say we need this new, we need these new services extended. And by and large, we missed that opportunity. As the school, you've just created the opportunity as a school because you've gone ahead and connected yourself to the Metro Ethernet, which extends those services out to areas where they might not have existed before. So you, you've taken the opportunity to exert the pressure Whereas the Colorado Telehealth Network project, I'm not going to blame the company or the project itself or the, or the hospitals. The project as a whole failed in that regard. If we have a regional broadband plan, then we can stand up in the, north, in the northwest Colorado region and say, we're not going to fail in that regard again. We're not going to let that, uh, the, these types of opportunities slip by us. So that's, that's, the, that's why I bring that one up in, in that regard. So thank you. Fiber offers, fiber's faster. That's, a, that's one of the slogans that my company uses. That's just that simple. Fiber is faster. Uh, the theoretical capacity, we, we use a little example of, uh, and I don't have the pictures here, but so I'll just talk through it. We use a little example. If you have a standard drinking straw, and uh, that represents your historic uh, dial-up capacity. And if you take a little bit fatter drinking straw, then that's the slow DSL type of capacity. Uh, uh, when we talk about the capacity of fiber compared to that uh, drinking straw, 100 megabit capacity, which is where we start out with fiber deployments, represents a, a culvert. And the capacity of fiber today, without spending a huge amount of money on the electronics, uh, represents a, 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 a drainage pipe at the Hoover Dam that is 50 feet in diameter. And the theoretical capacity of fiber optics today, compared to the drinking straw of dial-up, is the capacity of the entire Hoover Dam itself. Fiber is faster. And so if we have the opportunity to deploy fiber, there's a, there's a lot of economic questions about where do you really need fiber in the last mile? Uh, Google has said, yes, you do. Uh, and another of other communities across the nation have said, yes, you do. Uh, uh, many communities have said no. Most of the telephone companies and cable companies have said no. We don't need that. But remember, we're a middling country. And we're, a middle, we're the tail end of a middling state of a middling country. I got distracted there for a moment and my screen went to sleep. There are several other types of technologies that can deliver to last mile. Mobile or cellular service is something, especially as you talk about LTE and other things of that nature. People are talking about how that is going to be the end all and be all. I contend that it's not. Mobile and cellular has its place, especially uh, for mobility. Uh, but as far as reliability and capacity, I think you will always bump up against problems when you're using uh, a mobile service compared to a fixed wired service. Uh, there is a, there's satellite service. There are places, especially here in northwest Colorado and along the entire western slope, where there is no access to fiber. There's no access to cable. There, you're outside of the bounds for DSL, and so there's no access to DSL. 
the wireless service providers. Wireless depends largely on line of sight for a fixed wireless service. And the mountains and the trees in this beautiful region make that difficult sometimes. And sometimes the only thing you can do is throw up a satellite and call up HughesNet and ask them to provide you your broadband service. Uh, there is no place in northwest Colorado that cannot get broadband because satellite provides broadband throughout this entire region. But that's a difficult, I, I would never say to somebody, you, I mean, y'all remember, when we talk about latency, y'all remember how the newscasters used to have the satellite uh, feeds and, and the, 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 the host would ask a question and then you'd sit there for three seconds? Oh, yeah, and then you'd get the response? Uh, that is what happens when you're using satellite broadband. You send a request, and you have to wait those three seconds. Uh, if you have a, a, a large uh, in, user interaction intensive type of an application, like you're filling out a form, or, a, or you're using a database, or you're trying to have any type of two-way communication, that becomes completely untenable. Uh, another one that I throw up here, not because I believe in it, but because you will hear about it as you study broadband and municipal broadband deployment and fixing broadband problems. Broadband over power lines. Um, if any of you have seen it work anywhere, tell me. Because I've been, I've been hearing that broadband over power lines, I, I was working on a project in Utah, uh, in Utah called the Utopia Project, which was fiber to the premises uh, in 16 different uh, cities. We started the project in 2003. Uh, and in 2003, we were told, no, you don't need to do that because we can do broadband over power lines. I still haven't seen it working anywhere. And so if anybody has, I need to know so that I can change my tune. Is that like an interference issue or what? It, largely an interference issue is what's caused. And all, you know, simply, this is, the power lines are not designed for two-way communication. They're not designed for any communication. Uh, but when you start talking about needing to do two-way transmission on a power line, it, it, you're, it just doesn't work. Putting the signal on the noise. Putting, putting a signal. Oh, well, and that's the theory. That's yeah. the theory of broadband over power lines: is you're putting a signal on the noise. Yeah. But it, but just that con just the, that concept, it is the noise that you had to put the signal on. I have seen experimental broadband over power lines in homes where you plug in a device into your power outlet, and then you can plug into any of your power outlets, and it distributes broadband. But with the, the, with the fantastic uh, uh, advances in uh, Wi-Fi and the low cost of Wi-Fi, uh, it doesn't make any sense to even do it in a home. Uh, I've never seen it work over any type of a distance. So uh, as we talk about the last mile access, the last mile capacity brings you back to a point of aggregation within your community owned by your internet service provider. Your internet service provider has to get capacity from somewhere, and that is the middle mile infrastructure. Uh, as we've talked about, the EagleNet network is a middle mile infrastructure network. Uh, the EagleNet network um, is doing most of its uh, delivery over a fiber optic mechanism. I put these, middle mile comes typically in three different ways. It either comes to you via your copper network, it comes to you via a fiber network, or it comes to you via a microwave link. Uh, this, this piece of copper and this piece of fiber have roughly the same capacity in today, with today's technology. Um, so typically when we're talking about middle mile access, it's very seldom delivered over the copper uh, cables any longer because it just simply does not have the capacity to do it. And so most of the middle mile infrastructure is fiber optics. Uh, throughout the Northwest Colorado region, you have a significant amount of middle mile fiber optics. You have a, uh, a big route that level three put in that runs along the Union Pacific uh, railroad line from Denver all the way to the state line and beyond. I don't know where it goes from there. We know every time it derails, the, the it train goes out. Yeah, the, the, the L3 goes out at yeah. that point, yeah. You also have a, a fiber-rich environment along the I-70 corridor from Denver to at least uh, um, 
almost the border. It doesn't go, it, the, it, the fiber starts petering out as you get closer to the border. Uh, you have a, a company called Strata Networks who has put in fiber from Vernal down to uh, Steamboat Springs and over to Craig. Uh, you have CenturyLink who has put in fiber to each of the county seats. Uh, the biggest problem you have with your middle mile fiber right now is every time a train derails, it goes out. Or any time a backhoe hits the CenturyLink fiber. You remember the, uh, in 2011, I think it was, when you had the CenturyLink fiber cut and, and Walden and Steamboat and Craig were out for six hours, I think it was, because of a single fiber cut, uh, you'd have no redundancy. But if you, if you look at where the fiber is, you could build redundancy if you could encourage your companies to work cooperatively. If, if uh, CenturyLink was willing to hook up with Strata, that outage would not have happened because there would have been a redundant link. If level three would hook up with CenturyLink, then when the trains derail, you wouldn't lose service because the fiber exists. But it's a matter of getting those organizations to work cooperatively. And I think that that's another thing that a regional broadband plan can help you to do. Where fiber doesn't exist, the next mechanism that brings in uh, service is almost always a microwave link. Uh, microwave is a, a point to point line of sight type of service. Uh, it does have good capacity, not extraordinary capacity like fiber, but it does have good capacity. Uh, it's a fairly easy capacity to upgrade because you can put a, a additional antennas up as need be. Uh, it does have a little bit of weather fade, but the weather has to be extremely severe for that fade to happen. So microwave links are a very good way to, to get redundancy. Uh, so as we look again at some of the more rural communities, we look at Walden and our Northwest Colorado uh, broadband plan. Walden has a piece of fiber coming up to it from CenturyLink, but it has no redundancy coming out of there. But EagleNet is looking at putting in a microwave link from Cheyenne and there's another private company that's looking at putting in a microwave link uh, from Laramie. Uh, and so all of a sudden now, the little town of Walden with all 800 residents has three broadband links coming into it. And yet they are still in a position where if any one of those goes down, they lose service because they are not right now looking at cooperating with each other. But if we could get CenturyLink to lease service from EagleNet or the other private company and vice versa, then all three of those companies become um, reliable and redundant services, which is a critical element of broadband. That's something that we need to be able to do. If we could get CenturyLink, uh, CenturyLink and Strata to work nicely together. Uh, if we could get Strata and Level 3 to work nicely together. We can create some significant redundancy throughout most of uh, the Northwest Colorado region and solve one of the big problems that happens here. The next point that we have are the peering points. Uh, peering points are what connect the backhaul to the rest of the world. Uh, and so you have to get your backhaul back to uh, Cheyenne or to Denver or to Salt Lake City so that you can connect into the rest of the world through these peering points. The other interesting thing about this uh, diagram here is this diagram shows you uh, the secret behind monetization of broadband services. Uh, because the way broadband services are monetized is that each one of these, uh, these, these little blue things with the arrows on them are, are routers, or what they're called. And at each one of these router points, uh, the companies who own the networks have an opportunity to monetize their network. So what will happen in order for a company to make a living as a last mile provider is they will throw out a bunch of connections to end users and all of those connections come back to a router somewhere, whether that's your wireless access point or whether that's your central office or whether that's your head end for your cable company. They all come back to a router and at that router point they charge you for that connection and that's how your internet service provider makes its money. Your internet service provider has to buy uh, uh, infrastructure from a backhaul provider or a middle mile provider. And they have to pay at that connection point for that service. 
EagleNet's going to charge schools and also service providers to offer services. Uh, CenturyLink is a middle mile provider as well as a last mile provider. If you're a wireless service provider here uh, in Aspen, you have to buy your backhaul from someone and it's probably going to be CenturyLink and you're going to pay them for a connection. The school pays for connections and functions as an internet service provider for all of the individual departments at the school. And, and in doing so, you have to buy a backhaul connection. And every time those service providers will oversell that backhaul connection. Because when you're on the internet, you're probably not. And so I don't need to have, for, for your 15 megabit connection and your 15 megabit connection, I don't need to have 30 megabits. I can take a gamble and just buy the 15. In fact, I'm going to take a gamble and I'm going to buy a 6 to 1 or a 10 to 1 or a 20 to 1 oversell ratio. That's how internet service providers, uh, they, they buy that bulk line and then they shop it up just like any retailer does. Uh, the backhaul providers do the same thing. They oversell their backhaul to multiple service providers or multiple entities who are using it so that they can get more. The backhaul providers at their peering points have to pay for their connection as well. And they monetize at that point. So as we build a broadband plan, we have to look at that monetization model to create the incentives so that private companies will want to be able to provide more bandwidth. That's part of what we have to do in our broadband plan as well. In sum, better broadband access requires improving capacity and price of last mile access and ensuring capacity and reliability of middle mile access. So <coughs> as, we, as we work through creating a regional broadband plan, we have to look at mechanisms that encourage incumbent providers to reduce prices, increase capacity and reliability. We have to look at mechanisms where the business case won't make any case at all for a private provider. Is there a reasonable case or a reasonable path for a government entity to provide a solution there? Or for a nonprofit to do it? Or some other type of an entity to take into it? Uh, with Steamboat Springs, one of the things that they looked at when they decided to do their carrier neutral location was they said, if we built a carrier neutral location that reduces the cost for private enterprise companies to be able to come into the community. And so the gamble that Steamboat Springs is taking is, will the carrier neutral location reduce the cost for private companies to get their uh, middle mile access significantly enough that they will raise their capacity and lower their prices? That's what Steamboat Springs is trying to do with the carrier neutral location. It's one mechanism that they can use, but it's a mechanism that everybody could use in one way or another. As the school has expanded its capacity, you've created incentive for, I'm, I'm assuming you're buying from CenturyLink since you said you're using a Metro Ethernet product, uh, and you, you have created a greater incentive for CenturyLink to increase their Metro Ethernet services in, in, the, in the area. That service could be applied to now businesses and, and residents in the community uh, if we can work together to make that happen. So there are a lot of different ways that we can uh, in, in increase capacity and reliability and reduce price at the same time. And so what should we do? This is, this, this is where we start to look at what are the different mechanisms that we're going to use in the broadband plan. And uh, what I'd like to do, my next slide is the last slide of them all, and it has, uh, I think if I remember right, five different possible types of solutions. And I'd like to just have a conversation about those solutions. So the classroom time is over now, and I need your counsel because all of you live in this region. All of you work here. All of you struggle with the broadband capacity that you have on a day-to-day -day basis. I go home. I'm going to go home at the end of next week, and I'm going to uh, uh, fire up my... Uh, 20 megabit download connection and I'm going to start complaining about how slow my broadband is. Uh, I don't have to deal with the same problems that the people in Northwest Colorado do. I study them, I understand them, but I need you to give me counsel and guidance as we work through the conversation of these, poten of these potential solutions. So let's look at what some of them are. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there are two more slides. The legal context is something that we have to take into consideration. This one is just blank. Uh, uh, the conversation that I wanted to have around the legal context, the federal government is providing, uh, when we talk about broadband, the broadband is an almost completely unregulated aspect from the federal government's perspective. So when we look at the legal context in broadband, there's not a lot to talk about. Uh, telephone services, 
heavily regulated by both the federal government and the state public utilities commission. Uh, cable television services, uh, lightly regulated, but regulated by both the federal government and by the public utilities commission, and also uh, uh, most communities have franchise agreements in place with their cable providers uh, that provide another uh, aspect of regulation. Uh, the state of Colorado has left franchise agreements in the hands of the individual communities, so each community does have some sway with the cable provider that they're working with. But I will guarantee you if uh, the city of Aspen stepped up to Comcast and said, you will upgrade to DOCSIS 3 and you will make it available to 100% of our residents and you will do it before the end of 2013, Comcast will say, we'll, sell, we'll, we'll pull out. You're, you, are, you are a flea on the behind of a flea on our behind. Comcast has 170 million subscribers. Aspen can't wield a big stick on that. There's some things that you can do through um, your, your franchise agreement, uh, but there's not a lot that you can do. Uh, in the state of Colorado, the number one uh, legislation affecting broadband deployment is uh, a thing that was called Senate Bill 251? 150, 251. Senate Bill 251. I have a big old long write-up that I forgot to bring with me right now that tells me what part of the Colorado Revised Statute it's in. I'll have to bring that to my future ones so that I don't have to go through that. But what the Colorado Re Revised Statute does is it says that municipalities may not engage in uh, owning or operating a telecommunications, building on or owning or operating a telecommunications network. Uh, the, the state prohibits it. Uh, there are two exceptions to that prohibition that the state has given to communities. The first one is, is there's no, there's nothing in the provision that should be understood that prohibits a, a municipality from building a network to support itself. So that you, every community can build a network that connects the city hall to the police department. That's fine, that's perfectly fine. And if the community has excess capacity on that link, they can sell it to whomever will buy it. That, that's okay by state statute. The other thing that's okay by state statute is if you want to build a community network and you hold a referendum, like Glenwood Springs has done, like um, um, Longmont has done, a couple of other communities in the state have hold the, held the referendums, uh, uh, a public referendum will allow you to build a, and operate a network if you want to. So that's the legal contest that exists as we look at how we're going to build a plan. The federal government, uh, lightly or does not regulate broadband. The state government, uh, through the PUC, only lightly regulates broadband. Uh, the state government has prohibited municipalities from doing any type of telecommunication. That's what our legal context looks like, with a couple of exceptions. So as we look at possible plans, uh, realistically, we could do nothing. The, the, the plan could be that broadband is being deployed by private telecommunications companies and that's where it belongs. Uh, and we'll rely on them to use their business models to grow broadband in Northwest Colorado. Uh, the very fact that uh, the Council of Governments has decided to have a broadband plan for the region uh, indicates that that is not the inclination that the communities want. The very fact that you guys bothered to come to this meeting today indicates that that's not where we're going to go, to do nothing. But I do want to make sure that's always one of the very viable options and sometimes the right thing to do. And in some communities, the right thing to do will be to do nothing. The, the, the city of Denver, if it were to start aggressively pursuing uh, a municipal uh, fiber and optic network, would drive CenturyLink out of the city and that would be bad for the city of Denver. So none of us here are, are in Denver though. Uh, we can offer incentives and penalties for incumbent providers. Now this type of a package comes in a lot of different ways. I already talked a little bit about some of the things that you can do with a cable company through your cable franchises. Uh, you can offer incentives and penalties through your cable franchise. Uh, what, I'm, what I recommend as you look at incentives and, and penalties is that we start to create a, a package of incentives and penalties that are effective through communities throughout the entire western slope so that uh, so that as Comcast and CenturyLink and other of the larger providers come to the region, 
we're using that bigger stick of the entire regional organization instead of just the individual communities trying to make something happen. And that's one of the places where Club 20 can offer a huge amount of effort and impact, is Club 20 is in the business of creating uh, best practices for all of the 20 counties on the western slope. And if the best practice is to say that when you renew your franchise agreement, you do have these broadband aspects involved in your franchise agreement. That's a way to create incentives and, and penalties for the incumbents. Another way to create incentives and, and penalties for the incumbents is, is exactly what you've done with the school already, is to say, we have this huge contract, and if you will give us Metro Ethernet to all of our locations, then we'll continue to do business with you. Otherwise, we have to find another solution. We're going to start, build, we're going to start throwing up our own microwave towers. We'll do whatever we have to. We have to have this. We'd like to give it to you, CenturyLink, because you're a big, reliable company that has the, the wherewithal to manage this thing. But if you're not <coughs> going to give us what we want, we have to go elsewhere. So that's a, you know, that's a kind of financial incentive that communities can offer as well. Uh, in some of these communities, I look at a community like Walden with all 800 people. The county government in Walden is a huge contract for telecommunication. They can wield a little bit of influence in Walden. Uh, you could become a broadband friendly community. That involves a little bit more than just providing incentives and, and uh, penalties for the incumbent providers. One of the things that broadband friendly communities do is they have what's called a dig once policy. So every time they open up a street to put in a new sewer line or to repair a water line or to bury a power line, they put in three or five empty telecommunications conduits. So that when, a, when an incumbent provider or a new entrant wants to come in and build new last mile infrastructure to be able to extend better, uh, faster, cheaper, more reliable broadband services, that conduit already exists. And the cost of that construction goes down. If I have to dig uh, a new, if I have to bury new conduit, my average price in a, in a, uh, uh, a community with sidewalks and streets I have to be looking at, and with the rock that exists here in the Rocky Mountains, I have to be looking at about thirty or forty dollars a foot to put in that new conduit. It's it's completely cost prohibitive. To add that conduit to an already open trench, I have to add thirty-five cents per foot per conduit. If I want to put in three of them, I'm talking about a dollar, as opposed to forty dollars. And then when I want to pull fiber through that, I'm talking a, uh, about a dollar, a, a dollar and a half to three dollars a foot, depending on the size of my fiber and the amount of labor. So I can take my, I can take by, by just adding that conduit in whenever I do an open trench type of project, I can dr dramatically lower my cost of my conduit. Uh, other things that a broadband friendly community will do is, is uh, you'll work with your uh, with your power company to ensure that pull attachments are a realistic thing. One of the things, one of the cruel things that uh, telecommunications companies do with pull attachments, anytime it's, it's significantly cheaper to build overhead than it is to build buried. I can usually build uh, uh, aerial infrastructure for right around $8 per foot. Uh, and so if I can throw it on telephone poles, it makes a huge difference. But what a telephone company will do is, is uh, there has to be a certain amount of clearance between the electricity and the telecommunications, not just for the sake of interference, but when you get closer to that power, you have to have a certified electrician to do your repairs and other things of that nature. So you want to get out of that certified electrician's area so that you can reduce your maintenance costs. And then there's a gap here where, where services can be attached for broadband and other types of telecommunications. Uh, and what my, what my uh, wonderful cousins and the cable companies will do is they will take the very lowest position on that pole. And then when I want to come and add a new telephone provider, they'll say, you have to be below us. And so now I have to go through and move all of their attachments up so that I can come in and be at below them. Uh, it, it significantly increases my cost. But if you manage your pole attachments as a broadband friendly community, then you create a mechanism where you start at the top and you build down from there, instead of starting at the bottom and moving people up every time. It's a simple thing to do. Expediting the uh, permitting processes, expediting the, uh, the rules, 
having a plan for what you want your broadband to look like in your community. These are all things you can do to be a broadband friendly uh, community. We've talked a number of times about regional cooperative planning. Uh, one of the things that we look at when we look at the Western Slope, the entire population of the Western Slope only makes a reasonable, uh, a reasonable marketplace. You, you don't have a, a marketplace on the Western Slope that will drive broadband providers' behavior. And if you try to do it as individual communities, you have even less influence. So as we pull together to create a regional broadband plan, and we do regional cooperative planning, we can say to CenturyLink, well, you're coming into Walden with your fiber. We need you to connect to the EagleNet uh, microwave link so that you have redundancy through Walden. And, and if you'll do that, we have this capacity over here in Moffat County that we can make available to you. Uh, now, you know, Jackson County can't do that by itself, but as a region, you can. Uh, and Northwest Colorado is a, is a wonderful sized region. Uh, if we work cooperatively with Club 20, <laughs> again, we, we, we take the, uh, the, how many counties? eight counties, and we turn it into 20 counties. Uh, and if we can work cooperatively with Club 20, that's a good thing to do. Uh, if we can work cooperatively with the Southwest Colorado Council of Governments then, who are actively engaged in broadband planning right now, that helps us as well. Uh, we can build infrastructure to close gaps. And what this type of an action would be would be to say, okay, we have uh, a recognized need here where we don't have redundancy and there is no existing microwave or, or fiber path to create that redundancy. So as a uh, government cooperative or uh, nonprofit, we're gonna figure out a way to put that in. We're gonna go to the uh, rural utility services in the Department of Agriculture and we're gonna get a broadband loan. We're going to, we're going to go to DOLA and we're going to get a, a energy extraction uh, fund loan. Uh, we're going to pull together resources from our counties and our towns and uh, uh, from our large institutions in those. And we're going to figure out a way to make a financially feasible model to be able to build the infrastructure to close the gap. This one is a difficult one to do because in most cases those gaps exist because the financial model to close that gap doesn't meet the standard of profitability that the private companies have. But if we're talking about a nonprofit or, or other type of a mechanism where we're not having the same standard of profitability, we have a better chance of success at those types of things. The most aggressive action that can be taken is just, just build networks. I, I will be honest with you, I'm a proponent of community broadband networks. I am a strong proponent. Uh, when when, when uh, Aspen, I went driving into town, I drove past Aspen's airport beautiful little facility. I, I, it's a wonderful thing. And when Aspen wanted to have an airport, they didn't write to Delta and say, Delta, will you build us an airport here in Aspen? They didn't write to United and say, United, you, 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 we really need an airport. Aspen pulled together and bonded and built an airport. That's how communities get that type of infrastructure. Aspen doesn't fly any airplanes, uh, at least not commercially. They might have uh, some for search and rescue and other things, but they don't fly any commercial airplanes. Uh, private providers do that. And, and mostly in this airport, I saw really private providers. It's mostly private jets that I saw parked there. <laughs> um, but, but private providers are the ones who provide the services. Uh, and the same kind of thing, the same kind of functional infrastructure can work in a community environment, in a broadband environment as well. Uh, uh, we look at cities like uh, the 16 cities of the Utopia project. We look at the Provo project, which has recently been purchased by Google. Uh, we look at a number of projects across the United States of America growing larger and larger all the time, where communities have said, uh, we're not gonna let our broadband future sit in the hands of the private incumbents and their profit motives any longer. We're gonna step up to the plate. We're gonna provide this infrastructure uh, in most cases, not all of them, but in, in many cases, they do it on an open access basis, which means multiple private service providers can provide service over the top of that. Uh, when you look at a project like Lafayette, Louisiana, or uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, they've both decided, they're the two largest that have decided to be service providers themselves. And so they, 
not only built the network, but they also compete aggressively against the incoming providers. So I, I said that I wanted a discussion, and I took us almost to the end of the time without allowing any discussion. I, I'd love to have your feedback as to what you think, what, what you guys in this room think, the actions that the broadband plan should be looking at incorporating for Northwest Colorado. I look at the broadband friendly, and that just seems like a no-brainer. Why wouldn't we look for opportunities to make things happen that may be needed in the future when you're doing things um, currently? But I, I look at our valley, and it's a CDOT corridor. So how do you get people like CDOT involved and willing to be a part of that? I, and I have been working through the Governor's Office of Information Technology. There's a gentleman at GOIT named Brian Shepard, who is the uh, head of the broadband, what, I don't know what his office is called, but he has a couple of offices under him. He has been tasked by GOIT to work with CDOT to start turning the CDOT corridors into shared broadband infrastructure corridors, not just transportation corridors. Uh, one of the problems that CDOT has had, C CDOT has had two uh, problems historically as far as sharing uh, broadband infrastructure. The first thing that they've struggled with is building an effective model to uh, allow other than CDOT uses of that infrastructure. There's right-of-way uh, proofing that has to be done, and then there's agreements that have to be made. There's maintenance and, and other things of that nature. Uh, um, Lynn Yoakum, who is the Information Technology Director of uh, the Utah Department of Transportation, is a national leader in creating that, those shared models. Uh, and Lynn Yoakum has been sharing those with other states, and including Colorado. We've tried to, we've tried to hook up uh, Lynn, and uh, we have hooked up Lynn and Brian, and he's working to get CDOT to talk to her about the uh, best practices that she has developed for states across the country for departments of transportation to build and share and exchange infrastructure. So I think that that is part of, thank you for bringing that up, as we talk about being a broadband friendly community, uh, I think that it extends beyond just the individual towns and, and extends into the state agencies and the federal agencies that uh, touch our towns in particular, our uh, transportation. Uh, and as we look at, uh, like in Moffitt and Jackson counties and, and other places where the extraction industry is uh, a very heavy part of the industry, uh, the extraction industry always throws up significant amounts of uh, in broadband infrastructure. Every single one of those wells is connected back to uh, uh, communications tower. Uh, about half of those communications towers are registered with the FCC and the other half aren't. Uh, I, I, you know, I drive through, I have all of the FCC registered towers in Northwest Colorado mapped because that's part of what we're doing for investigating. And as I drive along the road, I always keep my eyes open. I go, that tower's not on my map. And, and I take a picture of it and map it down on my thing and I, and I try to find out who the owner is. Now, one of the things we can do to be a broadband friendly community is when, when those guys go in to permit their wells and their other and their communications infrastructure, just say, yeah, we'll permit it, but when you're done and when you're using it, you gotta allow us to share it with, uh, with the community and with other private providers. If we could throw, if we could have a wireless provider that was interested in throwing up radios and they didn't have to build the towers to put those radios on, that would make a significant difference in their cost structure. So thank you. You were raising your hand? Yeah, tell me about Northwest uh, Council. What, what's their plan? Uh, uh, you know, this is all about money. It's all about so money. So they're going to apply for an RUS grant. I mean, they've had three years to do that. Should they do that? Uh, will they do that? Uh, you know, what's, uh, are, you, are you retained by them to deliver uh, recommendations? I'm retained by them to deliver recommendations. Okay, so but I'm going to let Liz. Liz is the executive director out of the Northwest Colorado Council of Governments. I'm going to let her talk about what, what, what you think uh, the end result of the plan will be and what actions we'll be taking uh, in six months. Well, the Northwest COG <coughs> Council gave staff direction last August to look at broadband and see what we can do about it. So this is the 
new area for us to work on. So we have not applied for anything before then. We, we did get money from DOLA to put together this plan because it occurred to us that do something about Broadway and we don't know what to do. So that's why we need a plan and we need to look at where we are and what needs to be done and then decide what is within the Northwest Cog sphere of influence to take some action. So that's why we are putting together a strategic plan. I don't have any preconceived ideas of what the recommendations are going to be, so I'm very interested to hear what everyone suggests and what, what the end result is. We'll present that to the council and then they'll look at those recommendations and decide which, which things they'll be able to actually act on going forward and we'll decide that um, we're hoping to have a draft of the plan in September at their next strategic planning session to get direction for what they want to do for 2014. So one of the uh, beautiful airport you drove by, 95% federal funding. Yes. Uh, <coughs> next thing, I don't know if there's anybody here from Pitkin County. They have their own initiative underway right now uh, for a project. Okay, three of us. So, so three. So I need to make sure that I coordinate with you guys as we build, you know, broadband strategic planning for the region. Uh, that's one of the things. I mean, the, the county uh, has influence, but the county's influence is limited to the population and the boundaries, the geographic boundaries that you, you have. Uh, and if we could take that influence and expand it to uh, the entire northwest region and even expand it to the entire western slope, uh, then we wield a bigger stick when we talk about trying to get the incumbents to improve services. Now you lose a little bit of the influence because you know here in Pitkin County you have uh, an economic model that looks very different than, than Route County or Jackson County. Your economic model here is uh, a, a significantly different model. Uh, you can get the 95 percent. You need to be aware of that even in affluent Pitkin County every attempt at broadband residential services has failed. failed. Yeah. Other than it's a telephone company or a big you, you have, well, and, and here's one of the things that you have going on here in Pitkin County. A, a significant amount of, uh, of tourism is part, a big chunk of your economy. There's no incentive. Tourists don't pay for broadband. They expect to get it free from the resorts. And so the resorts have to work that into their models. And, and if it doesn't work into their models, they're not going to do it. And, and they, so the resorts have a hard time exerting influence to get something that they're not going to get uh, additional revenue from. Uh, the only thing that the broadband does for the resorts is it encourages more people to come. That's the only way they get revenue. They don't get direct revenue. It's an indirect revenue source. And so I've, I have found that uh, that resort communities uh, oftentimes have a, a, a broadband suffering because the large number of people that are in the community are not paying for the broadband and the small number of people who are residents of the community have to bear the full burden of the broadband capacity, uh, the cost of the links, as we talked about those peering point costs, the residents have to bear the full burden of that cost, not only for themselves, but for the two to one visitors that are riding free on their backs as well. So yes, resort communities do have a significant uh, broadband challenge that we have to look at and figure out how to do. The dilemma is if you're trying to deliver fixed broadband at high speeds, you're going to run out of money because there aren't enough residents that are willing to pay you back. And there's not enough commercial enterprise to support the infrastructure costs. Unless you can do the federal money like Unless you did you with, the, money, with the airport. And you can find ways to lower the cost for the broadband deployment and raise the revenue that comes from it. So are there ways that we can actually turn the, uh, turn the, the visitors into a monetization source for broadband, which is not, it's failed in almost every resort community that I've studied so far. I haven't find a, found a model to monetize that yet. Um, but can we lower the cost for a broadband provider? Can we get CDOT to provide uh, middle mile infrastructure so that the cost of getting that middle mile piece is lower? Can we incent a, pro a provider through uh, the government contracts and other things uh, and, and the franchise agreements? And so we have to look at how best to be able to accomplish that. Uh, and it's going to have to be a combination of those efforts, I think. Well, the point I, I would make is that uh, mobile, mobile broadband is a lot easier lot less expensive and it's faster. It can be deployed faster. It can be deployed faster. So 
I'm bringing up the, I'm challenging yep. the council to say, are we going to be a fixed pro broadband provider, or are we going to be, or is our goal simply to provide access, whether it be mobile or fixed? But the problem with fixed is it's so expensive. And my understanding, my understanding of the council's underwriting goal is to improve access in order to improve economic development. Uh, and if that means it's wireless, then that means it's wireless. And in many communities, that's what it's going to be. Uh, that's what it's going to be if they're not engaged in a project. They'll, they'll be a Wi-Fi network for guest access, and there'll be broadband access over the cellular system for residents. Which we have to drop that to wires somewhere, all of that. Well, yeah, of course, it gets connected. But the point is that the, and by doing that, we got the uh, cellular companies to pay for it. Good. And that's the approach that the county wants to pursue, but I don't know if they can make the numbers work. Yeah, well, and if we can make the numbers, the, one of the things that we'll do to help the numbers work for Pitkin County is, again, if we could drop the cost of the backhaul when we have to hook into the cell towers and into the Wi-Fi uh, network, then, then the revenue model, the profit model for the cellular companies and the Wi-Fi companies works better. Uh, and so that's one of the things that has to be engaged in the strategy is, is how do we reduce that, that middle mile access costs and those backhaul from those towers costs so that the model is incented better for the so, so private. Valley, when Glenn was asked but there's OC3 fibers sitting there, 155 megabits. You know, who owns it? It was Quest Fiber. Okay. So the okay. problem is you can't access it along the path. Yeah, yeah, you have to have add access drop points. Like where you can access it and ask for it. You know, so, so, so all you need to do is convince CenturyLink to put a couple access points in. Or, or, or convince CenturyLink to let the county build one. Right. So, so that you know the county doesn't have to build the the whole fiber route <laughs> at forty dollars a foot. There's more fiber than they could ever use here. The the county, yeah, and I'm finding that through a lot of the region as well. But, but again, there's no add drop points. Right. So. You have to convince CenturyLink to allow an odd drop point, uh, and if you don't have a revenue model for them to do it, if you have a, a finance model that allows you to build that ad drop point, uh, will they let you do it? That's that's part of what we have to do as part of this regional broadband plan is figure out ways to allow those types of things to happen. That L3 route along the railroad track, you talk about limited uh, ad drops for CenturyLink. Try to get onto that one. Uh, it, it, we, but these are things that through the power of Northwest Colorado Council of Governments, through each of the individual counties and towns, through Club 20 and through other organizations, we can start to exert influence and say, we, this is what we need to do. Here's our regional plan and here's why this ad drop point is important to the regional plan. Uh, and, and we can show that it will make a financial model for them as well. Um, and so when we talk about borrowing our U.S. money to do something, uh, maybe the something that we're going to do is build an ad drop point. Maybe the something that we're going to do is add a microwave link between uh, two communities because there is no redundancy in that area. Uh, maybe the something that we'll need to do is to put up a, a Wi-Fi access point uh, to cover an area that is not uh, effectively covered. Or maybe the something we need to do is to uh, build last mile infrastructure, wired infrastructure. Yeah. The region is uh, vast and vastly different from one corner to the next. Uh, and so as we talk about a regional plan, I think that one of the things that's going to happen is people are going to look at the regional plan and they're going to be a little bit disappointed that it doesn't have more specifics about how, how are we going to take care of the south end of Pitkin County. Uh, the regional plan is not going to go into the specifics of each and every single uh, corner of the entire region. We'll use some of those corners as case studies and a better understanding, but the regional plan is designed to answer the question of how do we get better access for economic development in the Northwest Colorado Council of Governments region. Uh, and so some of the, you know, some of the readers may be a little disappointed that uh, it doesn't say, well, this doesn't have my address. My house isn't on this plan. Uh, they, they won't. Thank you. That was very useful to me. I appreciate that comment. Um, you're going to make a suggestion because I've never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, 
fiber route is kind yeah. of the one. If you map exactly all of the fiber routes in these 20 counties, every 40 miles on the fiber route, you have to put a regeneration yes. facility. Those are your cheapest access points yep. for my bandwidth. Thank you. You've got to get fiber to those points. Uh, uh, we've got to get fiber or or point to point we've got to get to those add drop points or we've got to add them where so the they don't already exist well you cut it in you cut it in uh, buffer tube at a time it's right. uh, it's saying that's their reluctance yeah. operators say wait a minute no i know i know and and, and I, I have to say well okay <laughs> Uh, you have a repair plan and you I mean we'll follow your rules to right. cut in a new ad drop site just tell us what your rules are I've you know I Once you have that backbone access then private uh, providers can, can uh, take care of the rest absolutely and that's part of the ther theory in Steamboat Springs with the carrier neutral location is it's creating uh, not only an ad drop point but also a, a, a climate controlled facility that uh, carriers can jump into um, so did you sign in on the paper? So I have your email address then, and so I, uh, uh, I don't know your name right now, and, and if you tell me, by the end of the week I will forget. Uh, but I will send an email out to everyone, uh, and when, when I do that, if you'll respond and say, I'm the guy that said these things, and here's what I'm doing in Pitkin County and, in, and, uh, uh, and here in town, because uh, I'm very interested in knowing what you, what, what's going on. I'm very interested in coordinating with Pitkin County's plan as well. Uh, and helping, uh, you know, rolling that into the regional plan, not not directing what you guys do, but rolling it into the regional plan. Um, we're well past our 10.30 that we were expecting to end. Uh, does anybody else have any comments or thoughts before we uh, disband? I would like to say to all of you, thank you for being here. Um, when I do, I, I, I will probably send out an email uh, tonight to all of you who are here today. Uh, if you have feedback that will make this presentation better for the communities that I'm going to after you, uh, you know, thanks for being my guinea pigs. I need to I need to continue to improve it, and I won't be offended by anything that you might have to say. So <coughs> please feel free to be open. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.